Welcome to Japan Issues. Tokyo Giant. Shinzo Abe, 1954-2022. American liberals cannot understand the greatness of Japan's longest-serving prime minister. We would like to share the insights and analysis by Dr. Jason Morgan, an associate professor at Raitaku University in Chiba, Japan. At a campaign stop in the ancient capital of Nara on July 8, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated by a deluded nobody for reasons that apparently had nothing to do with politics. It may have been religiously motivated. Though, some reports indicate that the murderer's mother was a member of the Korea based Unification Church, which Abe was perceived to support. The assassin used a homemade pipe gun to shoot Abe twice from behind. So much, on the one hand, for the samurai spirit. In the old days, Japanese warriors knew exactly whom they were targeting and why. And it's not exactly high Chushingora style to punk out and hit your man in the back from 20 feet away. No swords, no ritual, no honor. So much, too, on the other hand, for Western liberals. Who since before the Meiji Restoration have proven completely incapable of understanding what is going on inside Japan. Like nothing else I can remember, the death of Shinzo Abe has exposed the gulf between the United States and its ally. A gulf that will never be closed as long as Washington remains under the sway of liberals. The fact is, Shinzo Abe was a Tokyo giant who changed the political landscape in Japan and built up pro democracy partnerships in the Pacific, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia. But to hear the Americans tell it, Shinzo Abe was a fascist and quite possibly heralded the second coming of the Third Reich. American liberals refused to understand Shinzo Abe. And they quite frankly didn't deserve him. The hour is probably too late to bridge the divide that they have created with Japan. Shinzo Abe was the one man who could do it. But now he is gone and the liberals who lambasted Shinzo Abe in life are gloating in his death. For a glimpse into the gap between Washington and Tokyo that Shinzo Abe was forever trying to close. Consider the hit which National Public Radio ran against the former Prime Minister. Virtually while he was still bleeding out on a gurney, a divisive arch conservative, NPR claimed. But was Shinzo Abe really a divisive arch conservative, as the Washington liberal consensus alleges? The short answer is no, on both counts. First, arch conservative, I wish. Had Shinzo Abe been an American congressman, he would have been firmly on the Democrat side of the aisle. And pretty far to the left of that group on many issues. On the environment, healthcare, public transportation, and fiscal policy, to name just a few areas, Shinzo Abe was a big government leftist. His Abenomics scheme to revitalize the Japanese economy was statism and money printing cranked up to 11. The national debt ballooned under Shinzo Abe. But neither he nor his core team of economic advisors blinked. Many so called conservatives in Japan continue to push the central bank to crank out more and more fiat currency. Ditto for globalist boondoggles like SDGs, the United Nations, and the Trans Pacific Partnership. Shinzo Abe and the ruling party of Japan for almost all the post war period. The Liberal Democrats over whom Shinzo Abe presided were in no way conservative on most of the things that Americans would recognize. Shinzo Abe almost never mentioned abortion. He had no problem with Japan's having only slightly more permissive gun laws than North Korea and Singapore. He truly believed in parliamentary democracy as a kind of platonic ideal. And gave a rousing speech to the American Congress in 2015 that was a love letter to the Washington Democratic mythos. Even on national defense, Shinzo Abe was basically a Kennedy style Democrat. In April of this year, I attended a talk in Tokyo held by the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, JFSS, a policy research organization of which I am a member. 
Shinzo Abe, as JFSS's top advisor, was the keynote speaker. His remarks were heavily colored by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as by the looming invasion of the sovereign nation of Taiwan by the communist government on the mainland. Shinzo Abe proposed at the talk that Japan beef up its defense spending from 1% of GDP to 2%. This is as mainstream as it gets. A 2% of GDP defense budget would put Japan roughly on par with Australia, France, and Taiwan, and still leave it well behind Vietnam, the United Kingdom, and South Korea. It should be noted that Shinzo Abe wanted to spend more on defense to defend not just Japan, but also fellow democracies like Taiwan. Someone else gave a speech like that once, if I recall. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend. Oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge, and more. So spoke that arch conservative warmonger John Fitzgerald Kennedy in 1961. But Kennedy was a white American liberal. They get away with a lot more than you might think, and have to answer for a lot less. American professor Jeff Kingston, for example, found it difficult to write a sentence during the Shinzo Abe years which didn't connect the Japanese prime minister with fascism. Tokyo-based journalist Jake Adelstein, whose life story, which may be faked, is the subject of an HBO series, threw Aristotle's law of identity to the winds to insist that Shinzo Abe was literally Hitler. American liberals like Kingston and Adelstein never tired of reminding us that Shinzo Abe's maternal grandfather Kishi Nobusuke had been jailed by the American occupation for war crimes in Manchukuo. What the liberals often leave out is that Kishi then went on to serve as prime minister after the war, brokering the U.S.-Japan alliance that gave Washington an archipelago-wide airfield and left the U.S. military free to carpet bomb from Pyongyang to Saigon. In my view. Kishi wasn't guilty of war crimes until he collaborated with the American Empire. At any rate, Shinzo Abe carried on his grandfather's legacy of integrating Japan's geopolitics into Washington's. And for that bit of muscular democracyism, Shinzo Abe was literally Hitler. Why were white American liberals so touchy about Shinzo Abe? Because while Shinzo Abe cooperated on liberal projects like nation building and free trade, he refused to accept the manufactured history that whitewashed white American liberal guilt out of East Asia. He bought into the need to defend and expand democracy in Asia, in other words. But he didn't think that the price for that deal ought to be lying about what really happened in this part of the world in the 1930s and 40s. Shinzo Abe's drive to revise the Constitution Washington Communists and New Deal liberals imposed on Japan in 1946 was the absolute limit. It was that effrontery which won Shinzo Abe the most unhinged attacks from today's Rooseveltians. Shinzo Abe wanted to work with the Americans, but based on factual history. Not the Washington fairy tale. University of Connecticut professor Alexis Dudden, a seasoned anti-Japanist and Shinzo Abe hater, took to the pages of The New Yorker to repeat one of her favorite slurs against the gunned-down prime minister, Holocaust denialism. Shinzo Abe of course never denied the Holocaust. And he apologized repeatedly, as did his predecessors throughout the post-war, for wartime suffering caused by Japan. Dudden even wrote a book about those apologies. But perhaps Dudden didn't quite catch what they meant. She has a limited grasp of even basic Japanese, after all. This is a surprisingly common trait among the American Japan experts. But it isn't incidental. The monolinguism of American Japan hands gets to the heart of why the Japan US alliance is unsustainable. In Dudden's desperation to paint the dead Japanese leader as a Holocaust denier can be seen the real reason Shinzo Abe was so hated by the academic left. 
Shinzo Abe committed what, to American liberals, is the one unpardonable sin. He refused to let them write his country's history. Few Americans will have heard of the War Guilt Information Program. But it is central to the shifting sands of today's U.S. Japan alliance. During the American occupation of Japan, communists and liberals in the American military and government waged psychological warfare on the Japanese people. After having firebombed and atom bombed supine cities filled with women, children, and the elderly, Washington was eager to convince Japan, the world, and perhaps itself that there had been no American war crimes during World War II. The War Guilt Information Program was part of the attempt by Washington to rewrite Japanese history to make it seem that only Tokyo had been to blame for the destruction of the war in Asia and the Pacific.